Welcome and thank you for coming to the CUSID website to view this awareness session of the Wales Safeguarding Procedures Children at Risk. All of the documents mentioned throughout this presentation can be found on this website and there are many others too. It is always useful to come to this website from time to time as there are always new procedures or processes available which are useful to our work in safeguarding. Please remember that this training does not replace any local statutory safeguarding training you may have as it is purely to introduce you to the um, Wales Safeguarding Procedures which was launched in 2020. Presenting today will be Emma Rees. She is a Child Protection Conference Chair in Pembrokeshire for the safeguarding uh, team and I will be supporting her. I'm Ethley Weilerman and I'm the Assistant Team Manager for the Integrated Safeguarding Team in Pembrokeshire. We've both been part of the um, regional group who put together this presentation with a lot of assistance from Julie Brecken from the Mid -Wales, as the Mid and West Wales Safeguarding Board Manager and also her support team. I'm now going to hand you over to Emma. Thanks. Hi, welcome to this awareness session. Um, so just to reiterate what Ethel's just said, this training is delivered by the Mid and West Wales Safeguarding Board. It's an introductory overview to the new Wales safeguarding procedures. There is a responsibility for each agency to develop their own delivery plan to provide in-depth training. Um, this, is, this presentation has been adapted by materials provided by Social Care Wales who have led the national product project and um, this does not re replace any safeguarding uh, training st that should be um, standard. Okay, uh, there's just a bit of a, a content then what we're going to go through. We're going to have a look at legislation and guidance, the headlines, the key changes to practice, the key principles of safeguarding practice, practice definitions and types of harm, the duty to report, key principles within a child protection conference, safeguarding allegations and concerns against those in a position of trust and the key changes to adults at risk. Um, there are some points to note here. The language used in this training aligns itself with the Social Services and Wellbeing Act of 2014 and statutory guidement, guidance. You may find some differences where maltreatment is sometimes used instead of allegation and disclosure is also sometimes used instead of allegation. Um, if you're aware or find anything else that the procedures that you're not sure about, um, please bring it to our attention. OK, so if I have a quick look at the legislation and guidance, um, I think it's always useful to have a bit of an overview of the, the current guidance. So um, these are the, the key things that anybody working with children should um, know about or know how to get access to. Um, so the Social Services and Wellbeing Wales Act of 2014, in particular part seven, working together to safeguard people. Um, there are still sections of the Children Act 1989 which are relevant, the Codes of Practice under part 10 of the Social Services and Wellbeing Act, the Mental Capacity Act of 2005, the European Convention on Human Rights, particularly articles two, three, five, seven, sorry, five, six and eight, the United Nations Conventions on the Rights of a Child and the Welsh Language Standards with More Than Just Words Framework. Um, also linked to that is the whole of the Social, Social Services and Wellbeing Act, Wales Act, Working Together to Safeguard People, Volume 5 and Safeguarding in Education. Um, what the new procedures do is they strengthen and clarify safeguarding practice. They accurately reflect the statutory guidance and is standardised across all agencies and all of Wales. So what these do is they replace all previous procedures. So the All Wales Child Protection Procedures 2008, you might remember the white and red book that was sat in everybody's office. Um, they are no longer valid and the Wales Interim Policy and Procedures for the Protection of Vulnerable Adults from Abuse 2010. So the Wales safeguarding practice for all practitioners and managers in Wales, that means it's for both devolved and non-devolved agencies, statutory third voluntary and private sectors, health, social care, education, police, justice and all other services in both paid and unpaid or volunteer roles. So what are those key changes? So the new procedures link safe, procedures for safeguarding children with procedures for safeguarding adults at risk. They're both made up of five sections and contain pointers for practice. And there are some all Wales practice guides within the, within the children's section. OK, so some of the key changes. Um, previously, a duty to report. Um, sorry, the duty to report replaces the older term of making a referral to social services. 
Um, so previously you would have made a referral and now you make a report. There's a much more emphasis on being child centred. So the practitioner needs to develop an understanding of the child's everyday life and the daily lived experience. The child's concerns themselves are recognised as well as the child's wishes and feelings. It should be a co-production of a response leading to positive outcomes which are identified by the child and the, it should be outcome and strength based focused. OK, so one of the things we really want to know is the lived experience of the child. So it's trying to understand what a typical day would look like for that child. So here are some examples of the kinds of questions you could ask. What a typical day in their lives is like for them? What their feelings are about their day? What they might like to change? And it's really important to consider different communication methods for disabled or maybe nonverbal children. The fact that they're not able to express it, you know, isn't sufficient. It needs to be considering, you know, their routines and patterns and, and other things with the people that know them well. So historically, the focus is on presenting signs and indicators. So they were, you know, kind of specific concerns um, and actually it was just the tip of the iceberg, whereas now um, we're looking more on the impact. So it's the patterns of behaviour that are both positive and problematic, the motivation and ability to change and make meaningful outcomes. So we're really looking at the iceberg that's below the water. So historically it was done to, we were doing an investigation, we were completing our inquiries, we were f following a process and doing what the procedures say. The idea now is that co-production, it's doing it with. We're really trying to engage with the child or family and bring them along to enable them to know what difference needs to be made and how they, the changes that they need to make to their life. And by doing this, hopefully we can achieve meaningful improvements to people's circumstances. So the term child protection plan is no longer used and it's been pre um, replaced with a care and support protection plan um, and that's overseen by a care and support protection plan coordinator. So there would be a named social worker with practitioner responsibility for the case and they would be responsible for coordinating the preparation, completion, review and delivery and as well as revision of that plan. So who has a responsibility to report? We all do. We all have a responsibility to contact social services or the police if you know or have concerns or suspicions that a child or adult is at risk. Um, the relevant partners include police, education, local health boards, NHS trusts, also the third sector and voluntary organisations. Safeguarding is absolutely everybody's responsibility. It is not a matter of personal choice. So within the four um, authorities, we all follow um, the signs of safety and solution focused practice. So it's embedded in varying degrees across the four authorities. Um, however, this new model of the whale safeguarding procedures aligns well with the um, ethos and they do fit well together. So what are the key principles? So from the Social Services and Wellbeing Act, it's about the voice and control of the individual. It's about prevention and early intervention to try to get involved and get the help before issues escalate. It's about effective multi-agency and partnership working. It's that again that idea of person centred practice, what is going to work individually and so that there's less siloed working. So everybody's working together for that common purpose. So a practitioner has two tasks. One is to prevent situations where a child may be experiencing abuse, neglect or harm. And if they're unable to do that, then to identify emerging concerns about abuse, neglect and harm to the child. So there's information, advice and assistance. So local authorities under the codes of practice have a duty to establish an information, advice and assistance service. So that would proactively promote early intervention and prevention. It would emphasise advocacy and co-production and would provide the public with information and advice to prevent escalation of difficulties to situations that require more intensive specialist intervention. So there is, as Ethel mentioned earlier on this website, you'll find some relevant regional policies. So this one is about information sharing protocol for safeguarding. And also about the right help at the right time, which goes to that idea of early intervention all the way through to protect, protect, a protective support. 
So what are those definitions and types of harm? So in terms of a child, the Social Services and Wellbeing Act um, defines a child as a person aged under 18. I think it's really important to remember that some children um, who are in a school or college environment could legally be adults and equally um, some children may have left school uh, but still be under the age of 18 so they may be living independent lives but be under the age of 18. Um, the Wales Safeguarding Procedures for Adults may apply um, for some children or some adults and so it's about looking which side um, of the procedures you need to look at based on their age of 18 and also the managing allegations for those in a position of trust. So who is a child at risk? A child at risk is a child who is experiencing or is at risk of experiencing abuse, neglect or other kinds of harm and has a care and support needs whether or not they're being met by the local authority already. So some of the existing definitions have been amended and expanded and then some new definitions have been now acknowledged. So in terms of forms of abuse, there's physical, sexual, emotional or financial abuse. And these include abuse in any setting, including a private home, an institution or any other place and includes any harm to the child's health or development through witnessing another person being abused. And I think the emphasis there on that's quite recognising that there is a big impact on witnessing someone else being abused as well. Um, some of these um, existing definitions were physical abuse or induced illness, sexual abuse, child neglect or neglectful parenting and emotional abuse. So the previous procedures were written in 2008 and I think there's been a, a change and a recognition of more things that are actually happening and some of the young children are experiencing and so these new definitions um, respond to that. So there's educational neglect, nutritional neglect, financial abuse, domestic abuse, peer relationship abuse, as well as crim child criminal exploitation, honour-based abuse, online abuse, human-based trafficking, child sexual exploitation and child trafficking. So the um, the procedures are really, really useful in terms of giving full explanations for those things. Um, the procedures are all online so they're all available on an app on your phone or um, just on a web-based browser and um, it's really useful and if you go into it then there's a glossary which is really helpful um, that can help see you through things it's really they're really it's really clearly laid out um, with some simple things to click on that can just take you through to the different sections once you're within a section anything that's highlighted you can click on and then that would give you the glossary definition of it so it's really worth spending in just a little bit of time um, having a look through it and getting yourself familiar with it. There's a wealth of resources in there. Um, it is regularly updated um, on the um, contents page. You can um, there's a, a, a section about this app and that will tell you when the most recent update was done. Um, so at the time of recording, the most recent update is the 30th of October 2020. Um, so Ethelou, I think we might have had some comments um, and people's feedback about their use of the app so far. Yeah, we've had quite a few people who've used the app um, for quite some time and some people who are using it very newly. So, um, so some of the uh, information coming back is um, that it's got a very clean interface. Um, it's easy to navigate, um, useful to know that it's being constantly um, updated. Um, it's useful having an app so that it's on your phone, so it's always with you. So I know as conference chairs, we've been sort of using them while we've been out in, in conferences. Um, it's useful that you can book mark on a desktop or a laptop um, unfortunately that function isn't available on the app um, it was something that has been fed back through our own training for for this um, but, it, but it is something that can happen on the desktop or the laptop um, having all the practice guides in one place is really useful. Um, it's simple to use and somebody really liked the highlighted definitions, which are great. Um, the pointers for practice are really excellent, one person had said. Um, it's great to have so much information and it's very clear to use. Um, good to have something on the phone, which we were saying about being able to carry it around with you. Um, helpful to have everything on the top of your fingers um, and the, they really like the glossary and the hyperlinks again um, to the legislation and these actually look very very different um, on the on the app as well. Um, and then somebody else had said it's really useful to have the procedures for the for children and adults all in one place as well. 
Um, yeah, so just, you know, um, in terms of, um, I know we live in a rural part of Wales, but once if you've downloaded the app onto your phone, the bulk of the um, information is available without any signal. Once you've downloaded that, it is only the hyperlinks that would then take you onto different web pages that you would allow need signal for. So even if you're in a, you know, a signal deficit, you will still get the bulk of the information once you've downloaded that app. Um, within that, within the pointers for practice, um, what they are is their helpful um, clues and tips into ways of putting the procedures into practice. So then there's links to extra resources um, and things which are also really useful if you're unsure of how to actually um, maybe um, turn the theory and the policy um, into your work. And so there's, there's clues and resources there for you. So just in terms of, again, highlighting some of these regional policies, if you don't know they're there, you're unable to go and look for them. Um, so there's just one here about the multi-agency protocol for thresholds. And then um, about section 46 of the Children Act with regard to police powers um, for agencies working with children and young people. So a duty to report. So if you've got a concern, there may not always be evidence of abuse, neglect or harm and um, practitioners may only suspect rather than know that a child is experiencing something. Um, so this may be based on information from different sources over time. So it's the idea of putting all those little pieces of a jigsaw puzzle together, some professional judgment and maybe that seemingly insignificant information which may form part of a bigger picture. Um, so in these situations where there's no clear factual evidence, it's referred to as a concern. So there's determinations there. So if you've referred in your um, concern, then the possible outcome is that things are not substantiated. So it was looked at. Um, so the decision would be that it could conclude with no further action. So a record would be made as to why Section 47 inquiries have concluded, why the concerns were substantiated and any other action that might need to be taken, which might be signposting onto another service um, and a letter of no further action would be sent to the family at that point. It could be that the concerns were substantiated and the child is not deemed to be at continued risk. So in this scenario, a child protection conference would not be held. Um, the record would be made for the reasons for that decision and to name all of those that were involved in reaching that decision. And then the next step would be to assess, assess whether a care and support assessment was appropriate. And the final outcome then is that those concerns were substantiated and that the child is experiencing or at risk of harm, abuse or neglect. And that would be the scenario that would bring us to a child protection conference. Again, there should be a record of the reasons that helped us reach that decision and the names of all those involved in making that decision. So this is just a nice little flow chart that just helps to show you through. So you've got that concern. You discuss it with your line manager or a DSP as a designated safeguarding person. You would make that report through to social services and the report would be received by social services. There would be that initial decision about whether it needed to go through to a strategy discussion or meeting. There might be Section 47 inquiries, which means that there would be someone going out to investigate and get more information. And then a possible outcome of that then is that a child protection conference was needed. So what are the key principles of a conference? Um, it's about trying to involve the child's voice and again attendance alone is not participation or giving the child a voice. So a child can be given a voice at a conference through advocacy. Um, so that could be from a statutory independent professional advocate uh, which they're entitled to through being part of the safeguarding process or attending with or on behalf of the child. Um, a presentation which could be a contribution, a drawings, pictures, anything that's prepared by the child that helps give an insight into their lived experience or it could be that they actively attend the conference which is something that I think as chairs across the across the region we do encourage if it's um, safe and appropriate to do so. So there is provision of advocacy, so the children have a right to an advocate if they're involved in a safeguarding process. That could be informal, such as a friend or family member, or it could be a professional that's commissioned by the local authority. If I could just come in there, um, 
Emma, when um, we did one of our live um, sessions, we did have some advocates at that um, uh, one of the live sessions and, and they kind of stipulated that it, it, it needs to be emphasised that a family or friend um, or, um, can't can't be as independent as sort of an independent um, uh, professional advocate. Um, so they would always kind of try and encourage that the professional advocate is, is used instead of a family friend for that child in, in a conference. Thank you. So parents at a conference, obviously we really want them to be involved. Um, it's really important that they've had adequate preparation from a social worker prior to a conference to make sure that they can participate. If they're involved in this process, they're not at their best um, and it is going to be, you know, more difficult and challenging. So it's really important that they explain the purpose of the conference and of registration, the process and their role within it and whether they are able to have an advocate as well, which they could do through their own needs if they've got learning difficulty, mental health challenges, Challenges. Um, it's important that they're given sufficient time to read any reports and ask any questions, um, help prepare for the conference, taking into account the wishes and feelings that's expressed by their child. They may have never heard them in that way from the child and providing support and guidance. Um, and I think it's really important in terms of those um, when it says about giving adequate time. Um, there are time scales now. Um, within the procedures. So before initial conference, it's two working days um, that they, the family need to have those reports um, and they need to be with the chairs and also with the family. Um, and it's for the responsibility of all report writers to share, discuss and explain. That is the wording from the procedures, their report. Um, it does say at least a day before a conference. And I think one of the things that the advocates brought through is um, the, the importance of making sure that especially if there are any, any additional challenges, any reading difficulties, learning difficulties, that they have as much time as possible. They're taking on an awful lot of information. There may be an awful lot of, there could be multiple reports for a single family and that they're going to need adequate time to go through that as individuals, but also if they've got an advocate, they're going to need to make sure that they've got plenty of time with their advocate to go through those reports. Um, with regard to review conference, there is a significant change to practice. Reports now must be with the chair and shared with the family five working days before the conference, which is a change from that 48 hour rule. So, Ethel, I'm not quite sure if there are any more comments from um, the advocates at that time. No, the, well, it was just, you, you touched on it earlier on with regards to the um, to the to them having time to to go through those reports with um, with the parents, and they have sort of stated that you know sometimes these can be several meetings. It's not just one meeting and going through that report. It could be two or three, depending on the number of of reports. Like you were saying, you know, there could be sort of three reports. There could be nine reports, depending on the the, the number of children so um so yeah so it's just sort of really kind of emphasizing that sort of making sure the parents have that time to read the report especially if they have an advocate so that advocate can go through those reports with them as well okay thank you um so the procedures also cover um safeguarding for those in a position of trust so what this part of the um, procedures does is it replaces part four of the professional concerns um, so it's a standalone section within the procedures that cover the entire workforce. It's a consistent approach across, so, across social care workforce, whether that you're working with adults or with children, and it provides really clear guidance for circumstances when the procedures should be followed. There are four decision outcomes, which again could be unsubstantiated, substantiated, unfounded and deliberately malicious. So what are these about? These are how to respond appropriately to safeguarding concerns about people whose paid or voluntary work brings them into contact with children or adults at risk. It also includes individuals who have caring responsibilities for children and adults in need of care and support and their employment or voluntary work brings them into contact with children or adults at risk. And I think examples of these is, is you know, scout leaders or brownie leaders or, you know, football coaches um, who, who coach um, young children at the weekend. So that's, that's just an example. So a practitioner describes anyone who comes into contact with children through paid or voluntary work, and there may be people with care and responsibilities for children in need of care and support. 
So what is a position of trust? So a, posi a person in a position of trust, um, if they work, they do, or the nature of the service they provide means that they are likely to have contact with children or adults at risk as part of their employment or voluntary work, have a position of trust, authority, power or influence over a child or adult at risk as perceived by them. So even if the adult doesn't think that, if the child feels that they've got a position of power or influence, that's enough, and are expected to safeguard and not act against the interests of another person. So who has that duty to report? Again, we all do. It's uh, regardless of anybody's status or profession or the authority. If you have a concern, you must report that if the conduct or behaviour of a practitioner or a person, um, you've got to report that through to social services or the police. And this includes if it's in your private life. OK, so that report that of that concern and behaviour might be about a friend, a family member or a neighbour if they are in a position of trust. So what might happen then? So there's the procedures for responding to safeguarding allegations for those in a position of trust. And that part of the procedures will focus on the practitioner or a person in a position of trust who is suspected of causing the harm. Simultaneously, the other part of the procedures will be responding to the allegation. And that is to focus on the child or adult risk who is experiencing risk. OK, so those two parts of the procedures are working in line with each other. Yeah, so where appropriate, it's important that you follow both sets. So what could be really useful and um, the questions to ask yourself then, are they likely to have contact with children or adults at risk of that part of their employment or voluntary work? Does the child or adult believe that they have a position of trust, power or authority or influence over them? And would you expect them to safeguard and not act against them? Yeah, so if your answer to no to those questions, then you're just looking at the um, the focus on the child. If the answer is yes, then you're going to be looking at both sets of procedures. Yeah, so is the concern a behaviour that has harmed or may harm a child or adult at risk? Is it a criminal offence against or impacting a child or adult at risk? And behaviours that may indicate that they are unsuitable to work with children or adults at risk. Again, if those answers to the question are no, you're just going to be looking at the children section. If yes, you're going to be using both sets of the procedures. So a person who has a concern, they need to record that concern and any actions taken by an employer and any safeguarding action by any relevant authority. You need to highlight in your records that it's a safeguarding allegation or concern about a practitioner, volunteer or carer and seek support and advice from your line manager. And immediately you need to report the matter to the designated safeguard in person. If you don't know who that is in your authority then or your place of work, your agency, then please go and find out following watching this video. So what that person will do then or the employer will consider does the information need further action? So there are possible outcomes from there. No, and that should be documented and a reason recorded. If you're unsure, then it might be that they seek advice from the social services designated officer for safeguarding. And yes, then it might be addressed through an internal um, practice or it could be to make a report of professional abuse or possible professional abuse and that would come through to social services. Once it's within social services then what would they do? They'd hold a professional strategy discussion which would be with a designated safeguarding officer, police, employer and any other appropriate agencies or partners and the purpose of that would be to decide does the allegation meet the threshold for progressing to a formal professional strategy meeting? Again the answer could be no and then the reasons would be recorded or yes and therefore a professional strategy meeting would be held. So what's the purpose of that meeting, the professional strategy meeting? This is to share all relevant information about the allegation or concern and the practitioner in question, which could include any previous allegations or other concerns, which is why it's really important that things are accurately recorded, because it could be that there's a, a pattern of events. To ensure that safeguarding criminal and employment procedures are properly coordinated, to agree any action to safeguard the child or adult at risk and any other children or adults at the risk that the practitioner in question has contact with to decide what information agencies can share with whom, when and who will do this and to agree a timescales time for actions and or dates for any further meetings. 
Okay, so then there could be an investigation, some actions following that. There could be further professional strategy meetings. So it might take more than one meeting to agree and to reach a decision. So the outcome meeting then, after all that information has been gathered, would decide whether on the balance of probabilities, the concerns are substantiated. And this is when you get to your four possible outcomes. They could be substantiated where there is sufficient evidence to prove the allegation. They could be unsubstantiated where there's insufficient evidence to either prove or disprove the allegation. It could be unfounded where the person making the allegation misinterpreted the incident and was mistaken about what they saw or was not aware of all of the circumstances. Or the final one is that it was deliberately invented or malicious. And that would be when there is clear evidence to prove that an allegation is entirely false and there has been a deliberate act to deceive. OK, so who's accountable and responsible for, hand, for handling those allegations and concerns? So all local authorities must have an identified senior manager known as the local authority designated officer or the designated officer for safeguarding. And that might differentiate, but that might be different between the different authorities. Um, their role, though, is to be accountable and responsible for allegations against professionals and those in a position of trust within their area. OK, so a practitioner may be considered unsuitable to work with children or adults at risk if they have been subject to criminal procedures that indicate risk of harm to any child or adult at risk, cause harm or possible harm to any child or adult at risk, and they may pose a risk in their work in volunteering or caring environment. If they've contravened or continue to contravene their agency's safeguarding policy and procedures, if they fail to understand or comply with the need for clear professional personal boundaries within the workplace. Maybe it could be because of the way they've behaved in their personal life and that could have put a ch child or adults at risk in the way of harm. Um, it could be that they've behaved in a way that undermined the trust they have through their position or if they've got care and responsibilities for a child or adult who is subject to safeguarding procedures. So if a child's name goes onto the child protection register, it, depending on the profession of the, one of the parents, it could be that they need to go through this process um, as a consequence of that. OK, so um, there are another relevant policy there from the CUSA website. So this is a multi-agency protocol for resolution of professional differences. So it might be that decisions are made within social services that people from outside agencies don't agree with. And this is your document to come to um, to have a look for help and support around that. So while this is focused on children, I think it's also important that we just consider that the, the two um, procedures with adults at risk do align. And so I think it's really important just to have a little bit of a flavour of that. So what are the changes for adults? Again, it's the idea of being person centred focus throughout. The presumption of capacity is implicit throughout. Advocacy duties are paramount. The adult at risk is central to the decision making and there must be communication throughout this process. And the duty to report is now explicit. But also what's important to note is no consent does not mean no action. Yeah, there are outline duties for the section 126 inquiries, which is similar to section 47 inquiries. It promotes an understanding of a person's lived experience. The lead coordinator replaces and extends the former DLM role and adult protection conferences replace case conferences. OK, so this is just um, you've obviously found us on the CUSIA website, but it's just to highlight that there is a wealth of information on there. And so it's really worth taking time and revisiting to have a look at all of the information that's available for you there. I think that's the end. Here we are. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much, much. Everybody for, for attending.